Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the Kundalini Yoga 3HO community. I'm your host, Guru Nishan, and I was born and raised in 3HO, and the people of our community matter to me. And so I started this podcast several months ago uh, with several intentions in mind, and I read them at the beginning of every episode. Number one, to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or who have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers know who are denying gaslighting or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural appropriation and exploitation that perpetuates the teachings, 3HO lifestyle and overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor each and every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. Number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy and other therapy and support as needed, to draw your own conclusions and to be critical thinkers rather than to just blindly follow anyone. Please remember that your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. On today's episode, I would like to welcome Gerard Lach, who was born in 1978 in Northern Germany. He became involved in Kundalini Yoga 3HO during the years of 2010 to 2017 after suffering a herniated disc and cervical spine issues, seeking healing and repair after physical therapy. Keeping his original name while integrating his new spiritual name, Gerard Jap Nerantar took to the intensity of Kundalini Yoga and the soothing energy of the gong meditation. After practicing for several years and feeling the tremendous impact of the gong meditations on his own body, he got referred to Nanak Dev Singh in Berlin, Germany, in which he studied and learned gong meditation training in 2012. Among other things, in 2015, he began to notice the culture of silence at the European Yoga Festival and among the leaders that nobody was willing to openly discuss Kartasing's sexual transgressions in France as a lead KRI teacher, even though it was a major topic buzzing around at the time. It would take him another two years to see through the facade of Satnam and realize that a whole lot of truths, both present and historical, were not being talked about in the community. I want to welcome Gerard to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast today. Thank you for being here. Hi, Guru Nishan. Thanks for having me here and welcoming me into this episode and yeah i'm i'm very excited to be honest thank you for being here um and i'm hearing your echo a little bit 
for having me here and welcoming me. I stopped the recording real quick because I can't figure out how to yeah, mute. I'm, I'm very excited. And I'm hearing your echo a little bit. For having me here and welcoming me. I stopped the recording real quick because I can't figure out how to. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Do you hear me too? <laughs> I stopped the recording because yeah. I can't figure out how to. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I'm still listening to the, I don't know, to the recording. Do you hear me too? <laughs> Okay, now I figured it out. Just make sure that you mute your YouTube version. It's okay? muted. It's okay, muted. good. So mine wasn't. That was the problem. So anyway, ah, it wasn't. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I, I couldn't. I'm muting my computer, and then I can't hear you. But anyway, so I fixed that. I'm starting the recording again. So just go ahead and respond from the place of me welcoming you. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it should be better. Welcome to the podcast, Gerard. Hey, again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. What an interesting um, lens of an experience. I'm, I'm happy to hear your story um, and have you share it with us today. Um, to get us started, can you let us know what's made you want to share your story or why you feel it's important to share your story now? Oh, Yeah. Thank you so much for really opening this space and having this this format of uncomfortable uncomfortable conversation, which I think have been really overdue to have. Um, there's so much stuff going on in the present. There was so much stuff going on in the past, and as I mentioned before, I I spent ten years in this whole um, Kundalini Yoga culture and cult um, structure, which I'm kind of happy about that it's only ten years, you know. <laughs> Of just the last the last days and weeks, I was trying to imagine and figure out how it must be if you are really born into this thing and it's just your whole reality. I mean, I I at some point in my life decided to um, get attracted and to go in there, and I could have said, okay, that's not for me, but I didn't. So it's just my own ex responsibility to some degree, of of course. But you know. Also, as I was preparing for this conversation, I was really digging into the dirt and digging into the deep stuff. And I was like, wow, what's going on here? The whole day I was like, so many images in my mind, so many feelings, so many frustrations, so many things that would have been talked to uh, from my point. But I tried in different years, like beginning in 2014, 2015, 2016, when I also do, did my research, what is going on, what was going on in the 70s, 80s, 90s in the American area. And I was like, wow, there's so much history going on. Nobody's talking about here, especially not in Germany. It, I mean, I, I always saw it like this. In America, things are happening. Germany is a little bit apart, maybe two, three, five, four years. That's, that's how the things are, things are, are going. But with this, like, wow, this is a completely different view, a completely different angle. And I felt kind of lonely sometimes, didn't know who to talk to about these things. When I tried to do steps, I most of the times experienced like, what? What are you talking about? No, that can't be true. This is such a big guy, it's such a huge leader, this is our Yogi Bhajan, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yeah, maybe, can be, but there are also other aspects to this. <laughs> Why is that not possible to even open the possibility to think in, a, in another way? And yeah, and that I, I, I think it's, it's for me like kind of a channel uh, to, to bring things to, to speak them out and to let them out of my system because there was a point where I had to figure it out on my own because there was no people, there was no really community and also like everybody's talking about the Kundalini community. Yeah, where is that really happening? It's kind of a superficial thing where everybody's acting like superstars and you know, but 
really digging the deep stuff, you know, <laughs> no better mm. not. We and don't that discuss was, that, right? That's the response. Oh, well, no. maybe not here. It's not not for yeah, the yeah. public place. Not for the space. Maybe then or. So I, yeah. I want to just pause and just say what I hear you speaking to is that along the way in your experience, you noticed that there were things that you searched on the Internet, whether it was Wacky World of Yogi Bhajan or, or other things that were online, like the history that was very much available. And you noticed, wow, nobody wants to discuss these. These things are just kind of like shoved away as if they're not important. And you stayed in the community, but you just kind of noticed these things along the way. And that that kind of accumulated and got more and more compounded over time until yeah. the 2015 mark. Yeah, 2014, 2015, okay. I, I would say. Yeah. And I, I want to say that, you know, you're really you're bringing up, you know, um, a cultural ethos that is pretty hard to detect because when you're in a spiritual community and the languaging that's permeating is mm. awareness, mm. truth, enlightenment, right? This kind mm. of pure consciousness lingo. And yet the energy that's being picked up is kind of like, wow, there's a lot of things hidden. And it's a, it, it's a slow process to kind of see that clearly because the nature of gaslighting is we doubt our own instinct. We mm -hmm. doubt what we're seeing. We doubt what we're feeling. And when we come from a historical, say, childhood trauma, we think that's normal. Mm -hmm. We're just like, oh, no, stop thinking so negatively. These are good people. And we, we push past our signals and our signs. And I, that's what I'm hearing you say, because you weren't born in. You did notice know, things. Whereas somebody born in, yeah. we don't know. We don't have something to compare it to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like that. I wasn't born into it, but I decided to step into it. And that was maybe it's comparable to to when you take that starting point. In, in my case of 2010, I, 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 yeah, I was born on my own decision into this, you know, and sure. then I and then it's just like, OK, you focus on this, you focus on the yoga, you focus on the meditation, you're doing your sadhana, you're doing two hours of meditation. Everything becomes more. This bubble grows, grows, grows bigger and everything. What was before, it's like pushed away. Yeah? You know, you create or expand this kind of own reality based on these, I would say also the techniques and as you said, like the language and the ethos and the whole culture and the specific spot where you are. I mean, there are lots of difference. This teacher teaches different than to another teacher. And what I also figured out, you can't put everything in one term and saying this is Kundalini Yoga. There are so many differences in areas and people and years and whatever, you know, but sure. all, all in all, all in all in one, what I observed, like that I came to, to a certain point where I realized how is that possible that people are chanting Sat Nam the whole day from sunrise <laughs> to sunset in God's name? Sat Nam, what they explain is you know, the truth or your true self or whatever it is or the essence of God or whatever you want to put there. But how is that possible to chant this mantra in God's name and don't want to see what's really going on and what the individual like one person experience as their own truth how is it possible in a in a cult in a culture in a community in a kind of society that this is the highest mantra but it's not integrated you know what what i mean yeah completely was, disembodied oh, totally it's the confused. essence of truth without a body attached to it yeah, not noticing what's there, happening it's... somewhere out in the ethers, but yeah, not yeah. in the reality of the relationships and the interday, everyday interactions we're having. Yeah. Yeah, like a lot of dissonance there, which which we obviously know is historical. And for me, like, regarding my own history, I, I also can imagine that it's maybe at a certain time of a, of a person's life it's so attracting to go into a reality like this because all the other stuff what they experienced before was even worse you know it's like 
oh, this is my healing. Oh, these are obviously nice people. Oh, there is a yoga practice. There is meditation. It gives me like a new experience. When I took my first Kundalini yoga class, I was totally overwhelmed. And it was like, what the heck is going on here? It was overcharging my system. It was overcharging my mind. It was overcharging my physical body. I could not walk for one week properly. That's what was my first experience of uh, my first Kundalini yoga class. And I remember that feeling as it was yesterday, like, wow, there's so much power somewhere. Yeah, you can put that into your system and it makes you feel totally different from one hour to the other. But when I look at it in hindsight, it was too much, too much in too short time, like totally overload. And that's what I, in my definition, see is kind of the characteristics of a tra traumatic experience to put too much in too short time into a system, which is not really grounded and balanced. Mm. Mm. I want to really pause there and just say that, you know, you're really touching on within your experience, your, your history of trauma and your history of addiction kind of set you up to really love that experience with kundalini yoga right that yes, overcharge sure. and that for like sure. give it to me all and and i really relate to that because what i'm now discovering is a long historical trauma pattern is the the intensity right going full into something just full mm. all in and that that is historically rooted in exactly what you're talking about of of just kind of like no holds barred um, power as opposed to the other type of subtle power which is like stable centered grounded mm. earthy slow sustained mm. right mm. not this like yeah, so that addictive more, more, quality more, 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 even right. more and more and more there's more there's more meditation you can do it for one hour for two hours and it's like also interesting because it's it's connected to this like yeah i can i can do it i can prove myself that i can do it and it's like measuring and yeah i did the next level and but this is the how, how the whole system is built up level one level two level three level gold <laughs> level premium and it's never enough it's never enough you are never enough it's always the feeling of not being enough the feeling of not doing enough and it's it's common up to the to the actual day like, yeah, hmm. I mean, really, well, really a good point. And I also just want to say that, you know, we've been hearing this in, in the themes around this, that what we thought might have been like, it really helped and centered me was actually just a dopamine hit, right? It yeah, was actually totally. just yeah. increasing, stimulating the system, overstimulating it, creating yeah. a disembodied, not a grounding, stable yeah. energy that yeah. floats us out of our system, which allows us to like, buzz Just through for a short kick and then the next one and then the next yep. one and then the yep. next. yeah 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 really uh yeah very interesting it's it's so interesting and that's what i also see um like um you asked the question why is it necessary that my story is heard like from this um, podcast here like this conversation and that's also one of the main aspects that i see um that um when I speak about addiction and my opinion, my personal experience, but my um, my way of experiencing addiction, like it began in my childhood, like my, my dad was a really heavy duty alcoholic. So that was my reality. And I grew up in that. So in that reality. So it, it was there from my early childhood to see and experience it, that this is kind of quote unquote normal yeah to to be in a reality in a realm of you know we 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 use substances to balance whatever we think we have to balance and um to see and also realize i mean yogi bhajan was said that's what i heard that in the 70s and of the 60s that was also like the main people he addressed to take these hippie people into the, the yoga thing and um, give them kind of a, another way to to heal from whatever they they thought they may, might heal from and to see and to realize that like practicing kundalini yoga in the in the way we just talked about it like ungrounded unrooted too fast too much maybe in the 60s made some sense i don't know i wasn't there i was born in 78 
But today, where we have so much other stuff going on, people don't need, in most cases, more, 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 and overload and overload and overload. And that's where I see the addictive part of Kundalini Yoga comes in. You know, I have, I have um, literal text. I, I joined like a self self help group for um, addictive personalities, and when I read these texts, they are based in Narcotics Anonymous and cocaine anonymous and all these groups which which are doing a really great work when it comes to guide people from their from their addictive behavior into a kind of balanced spirit, spirituality healing process um, and when i read these texts i almost could replace the word cocaine or any other drug with kundalini and you read that text and you see oh my gosh it's the same thing you are just addicted to kundalini just to that, like one shot after another. Mm. One, mm. yeah, yeah. It's, it's so for me. It's so obvious. It's so close. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say thank you for that. I, I can really track my own experience of when I came back to Kundalini Yoga for my own well, what I thought was my well-being, and for the first couple of years, it felt like that. But it was a sense of well-being to what my my original normal was which was mm, obviously mm. a trauma normal i didn't mm. know it as trauma but it was just mm, my mm. my childhood mm. normal and then several more years as i started teaching it i started noticing exactly what you're saying that i couldn't access parts of myself i could override parts of myself i always felt better after the practice but there mm. was there was parts of me that i couldn't actually touch like it was mm. too well formed, too mm. well penet impenetrable. And that was the message I was getting was addiction is just transferred. You know, you go from alcohol to yeah. yoga or you go from alcohol to a green juice. These are just transferable addictions. And then we think we're so righteous because we're taking this healthy addiction and mm. doing it every day. But the energy behind what we're drawing from it is very much the same. Yeah, and spiritual yeah, communities totally. do this so well, right? They yeah. they judge everybody doing the other thing, and yet it's just a transfer of addiction yeah. to not really feel yeah. the loss or the betrayal or the hurt or the pain or the abuse that's living in our body. We're mm. just using a technique or a substance or a person to fill that void of of of, of sensation that's not uh, allowed. Yeah, it's, it's just like a different frequency is taking over. You change from cocaine to Kundalini, you change from alcohol to cocaine. But the pattern is just like the same, you know? I mean, when you start yeah. drinking alcohol or taking cocaine or smoking weed, you have your reasons for that. And the first times it gives you a totally new experience. And it, in most cases, it feels kind of relieving or nice or you make a good, good experience. But there's a certain point, it's mostly a slow process where you don't see <laughs> what it's making or what it's doing harm to you. It's just like a slow process. And that's mm -hmm. what I realized is the same with the Kundalini thing. You know, you, mm -hmm. you're hunting something. And I mean, most people don't, maybe they don't make, make their much thoughts around this, but I spend a lot of time about thinking, what is this Kundalini at all, <laughs> you know? And yeah. when you go deeper into this and try to figure out what that is, it's like our our human experience, life force energy, you know, and the question how that is balanced and how how I can manage my own energy system without putting external things inside, you know, and totally. that's the interesting question to me, like, OK, how is it possible to manage my physical body, my emotions, my feelings, my experiences without being yeah dependent on external circumstances and substances mm -hmm. and what you mentioned before like okay when you practice yeah you feel good after this but also i had a point where i realized wait why am i feeling good afterwards because i felt really bad before and that's also a side effect of a intense regular kundalini yoga practice what i saw also the people i studied and trained with that for most or for lots of bodies, this kind of practice is not really working. It stiffens the body. And there was a time I was thinking about 2016 or something. I was 
really so stiff from carrying these gongs around and traveling and teaching and not being able to practice on my own properly, not being able to take massages and stuff like this. And then I realized, wait, when this system is so good, uh, so, so well working as everybody says always, yeah, it's a perfect system and it's working. We don't have to connect it with the teacher. It's just the teachings and it's a working system. It's a technology. Why? Am I feeling so fucked up? <laughs> I just made a <laughs> say that here. Something is not matching, you know? The same with the Satnam. <laughs> Why is that not working? Yeah. And for lots of these questions, I came to the point it's kind of not balanced. Yeah, practice. Yeah. But practice a way that's a good, it's a good good amount. Like Yeah. And it's a diff difficult thing to figure out because when I started 2010, maybe it also was a little bit different culture back then. Um, more the rough style, more like the, the Kata Singh style, what I wrote you before in my bio. My first teacher was also rooted in the Kata thing school, you know, in France. And that was the really tough, rough stuff. And Give us a lens yeah. into that, because a lot of us don't know who Kata Singh is. I know he was a teacher in France and he was a, a head teacher, but give us a sense of what that style was. I didn't know Carter thing personally or like in the in the teaching and taking classes context my neither so um, okay. but my teacher where I went to in, in the town where I was living I know that he was having his Kundalini yoga teacher training with Carter Singh and it was, was a really heavy duty pushing over the limits radical hardcore style I would say okay um, and I have to be honest in that time I liked it. Yeah, I, I liked relate. it. I liked, I liked it, it. Yeah, I mean, I was in my what's beginning of the thirties, you know, want to do something, want to rock something, want to prove myself something. But yeah, and for me, it's like when you see it on a vibrational level, you know, what what is attracted by what? Mm. For me, logic that I entered into the Kundalini Yoga reality and not into the yin yoga reality because it didn't match my frequency. Mm. That's what I see. People are going to be attracted there where it's matching their current frequency and they go there. So mm. that was probably my current frequency. And it was also, also, also the time where I was yeah, massive, massively struggling with addiction issues. I mean, I wasn't consuming all the time through through my life, but there were like episodes where it was really intense and there were some years I didn't take anything. But interestingly, almost in every case, I relapsed and started consuming again when there were issues in my life going on I couldn't handle and manage on my own. So, mm -hmm. And then either I choose to take drugs or choose to take Kundalini Yoga. And this Kata Singh, yeah, I mean, he was known at the Kundalini Yoga Festival for his really, really hard style classes. People were like, I once watched one. I didn't attend it. I was just sitting next to it and people were like, <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's like interesting exorcism class here. But although it looked like it was really bringing people to their processes i all I, I sometimes had the feeling like there's a lot of pretending and acting that mm. something is happening in this like kind of yeah who who is able to to cry the loudest that was mm. and maybe they were going through issues i don't know that i, ca I cannot say that but like it was like big theater i would say like sure. yeah yeah, that's that's where I had my entry into the Kundalini Yoga. Reality. That was at the at the yoga festival. No, it's, it's what the experience. What I see when when Kata Singh was teaching this class, what it was at the yoga festival. I had my entry in in Hanover where I was living, two thousand ten, and then I practiced for one year, and it gave me, you know, I had this disc issue, like the very very intense year of almost one year, so much pain, I could not walk, I could not sleep, I could not stand, I, I couldn't anything. It was just pain, 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 and cocaine. <laughs> but that wasn't the solution anyway. So, so and then came like Kundalini Yoga. And I mean, I wasn't a sports person before this disc, disc issues. 
And I thought, okay, maybe it's time to um, figure out a way how I can do something for my body and my mind. And I heard about yoga, I heard about meditation. I was really not, first I wasn't interested in, you know, I was like, oh, yoga, women go there and it's meditation and I don't need that. And, uh, but my ex-partner I was living with together in that time, she went to these classes before. And she always came back after the classes in the evening, like 10 o'clock in the evening, lightened up like a Christmas tree, like these eyes, and totally charged up. And I was like, what the hell is going on there with, with her? What are they doing there? And I was kind of interested in and But it took me some month before I decided to really go there because I had like, no, oh, no, resistances and I don't want that. Yeah, and at that time, it's it's kind of helped me, it nourished me, it strengthened my body for sure. And it was a really, really nice time also because it was a small yoga school, it was private at home, like eight, nine, ten people, like a really small group class, people coming regularly. And I also enjoyed like this community aspect, like belonging to somewhere, having people that are doing the same thing that are wanting to improve their life or want to do something for for their body and it was nice you know i still in i'm am in contact with people that i know from this time um but what then happened was like we were going regular to these classes and my former partner she was like um going into taking teacher training and totally digging into this world as as it so often happens like you go to one two classes and then doesn't take that much time before somebody says, maybe you should take a teacher training. Could be a good thing for you. So and there comes in the whole marketing machinery. Like it's the first entry level. You go to a class and you get fixed on. Yeah, you get the first line, the first shot, the first glimpse of dopamine, and then you're kind of hooked. And then, yeah, it's it's not enough because the whole system works like that. You have classes, then you have to go to workshops, then you have retreats, you have weekends to go to the yoga festival, you spend your whole life, your vacations, you work for free at the yoga festival. It's it just get more and more and more. And it's never enough because you have to teach a training level one. You have to do this. You have to pay for it. You have to work to pay for your trainings, which cost a lot of money. Then you have to take the second level. And that, that was happening like when we are in this relationship. And my, I made my experience with taking classes and doing my you know, little research on how Kundalini Yoga worked for me. And she kind of took a different way, like going into the teaching path. And it's for me felt like that we went apart more and more and more very slowly because for me, it yeah, just felt already there in 2011, 2012, where she was taking the training was like, it's just like a slow process, you know, some, some things I can't find the words for, but it felt like, yeah, kind of a small process of isolation from each other, you know, mm. can you figure out what I mean? So yeah. meeting as she got more and more into the teacher training plan, and you got more and more into yeah. wherever it felt like you just were slowly going in different directions, but it was separating like she was getting more and more in it was a really slow process because we did a lot of that stuff together we went to the yoga festival in germany where i had my first gong meditation experience on my own which totally blew my mind and led me to this to decision that i also want to learn how the gong works for me i didn't want to learn to teach kundalini yoga not at all i just wanted for me to figure out how how can i work and apply the gong in my life how can i bring and share that to other people that it's a profound and nourishing and balanced and good grounded experience and mm -hmm. not this overcharging. I mean, I know you also can overcharge people with a gong for sure. That's um, easily made and it needs a lot of yeah, knowledge around how to prepare and to ground a session that you can really can play and go deep with the gong to have it a good round safe experience. Um, and we did like this experience at the yoga festival. We went to yoga festival in France, but in between were also things where I felt like, wow, somehow it doesn't feel right to me. Mm. It's a nice experience. I, I like to see all that things and 
figure out what it means to me. But there was always a feeling like, especially when I was, uh, what I, when, I, when I'm remembering standing in Yoga Festival France, you know, you have this castle there and the lake and the tents and all these scenario. It's, it's, you feel like on another planet, you know? Yeah, it's very special. It's like a, it's super a world separate from a world. And I want to pause here and just say, you yeah. know, in, in a lot of the yoga world in general, it's very, very common for yoga studios to immediately promote teacher training because a lot of the only reason studios even yeah. exist is because financially it's they the main, can't they yeah. can't function without a teacher training revenue yeah. and so i'm pointing this out because that's not unique to our community yeah. but there's another added layer that i think um 3ho kundalini yoga does different than a lot of yoga spiritual worlds is there's the added kind of when you're a part of us and yeah. it's a whole lifestyle it's a whole world of a world it's not just the yoga practice but it's a slow kind of seduction like oh you should really start covering your head when you practice oh you look yeah. so good when you wear a turban oh you look so radiant and white oh you oh you should really do this and it's like this it's like a slow kind of cheerleading squad trying to get you into the into this world as if our world is so special and perfect and mm. that world out there is so evil and and corrupt and we together collectively yeah. are going to change that outside world yeah, and it's a, it's a common enemy enemy you find together yes and so there's a bond that says we're so pure holy come yeah. to this side and yeah. so it's a it's a slow seduction in that i think mm. this is very historical to the 60s and 70s mm. and i'm bringing this up because as i've read the historical stories one of the things i noticed was similar to the way it was in my network marketing career every ashram mm. kind of like became the cheerleader to say we got to get the most amount of people to the yoga festival or to uh -huh. that tantric uh -huh. or whatever so if you start thinking like about the contest how, yes. yes and so what that does is it creates an ethos yes. say like Russia. as germany we got to have the most from hamburg or we got to have the most from this area and there ends up being this excitement uh -huh. to recruit people in so that we have good representation at the next festival or the next white tantric together and that this is a part of the recruitment process in a way is we do long to belong if you find a practice that kind of like turns you on and energizes your system you meet a lot of amazing people that are heart-centered they're talking about service they're talking about humanity truth living above corruption all these things that are so seductive and yet within that world is all of those same dark forces not mm. showing themselves mm. oh wow never thought about it like this but it makes totally sense you know and yeah as you mentioned you have this uh, seductive part yeah and then you begin to realize okay i wear my normal clothing everybody's wearing white so and this is the, the 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 thin line between there and where I came from. So, mm -hmm. and if you keep on wearing your green clothes or whatever you have there, then you are standing out. You are not in, and that's where I was like what I described before. We went apart a little bit more and more and more. My ex partner and me, because she was really into this. And I I mean I did it also for a while. I buying white clothes and trying to wear a turban. But I also figured out what does it do when I wear a turban and I also made the other experience to really figure out from my own experience, my, my opinion, my feelings, is it really changing something mm -hmm. or is it just like a mind thing that I think mm -hmm. it changes something. And that's what I always kept for me to make this experience and make the other experience. I went to yoga festival, we had big gong meditations on the, on the main stage and I wasn't wearing white. That's a big thing. It's a big deal. How dare you? <laughs> Who are you to 
not wear our culture clothes here. And you, nobody says that. Nobody comes to you and says, would you mind changing your clothes to white? It's not even the discussion. They just don't look at you. They don't talk to you. And you're just not existing. I, I was standing, we had to talk about things to plan for the, for the gong meditation gigs with people who had to say something at the yoga festival. Let, let's say it like this, yeah? like mm. program director people. And I mean, it was clear we were giving this gong meditation sessions there, me and my gong colleague from Hamburg. But she wasn't white, I wasn't. And I was in a triangle conversation, but it felt like I was not talked to. I was not heard. I was not talked to. Even if I said something which was important to the conversation, there was no response to me. There was a response to her. And I was standing there like, wow, interesting. Who are the ghosts? The white people or me? What, what is that here? You know? It's... Wow. So you're talking about simple things that could easily simple. be addressed. Like, hey, yeah. if you're going to teach on the stage, will you please wear white, right? Instead, you get ignored, you get shamed, kind of like this this, this subtle way of communicating. You're not in approval instead I mean, I of just communicating. Uh, at, that, at this time, I did it on purpose. I said, I, sure. don't, I don't wear white. I, this is my clothes and my, my casual day clothes. I'm not interested in wearing white. I go on that stage and if you don't want to have me there, then fine. Bye bye. I'm not yeah. addicted to this stage. I know so many people were like, oh, if we just could put our gongs on that stage. I mean, I didn't I didn't figure it out that on purpose. I was kind of put on the path, like having my gong meditation training with Nanak Dev, and then he went with us to the yoga festival in France and I was nice experience. I liked it. But when we came into the position after he passed away, and we were in charge of taking these workshop spots and on the main stage in France. We did it, but at the first, after the first year, I realized that's nice, playing a gong to 1,500 people, but I'm not, I'm not addicted to that stage because I feel it's not my stage. If I cannot walk on a stage the way I am and the way I want to be and I want to, want to express and to share myself, under the big mantra Satnam, then it's not my stage. Then wherever, whoever, whoever should take over that stage, but not me. If I cannot sit on that stage and under the mantra of Satnam speak my real truth, what a stage is that? Mm. What a stage. Mm. You know. mm. Very beautiful insight. Yeah. And it also really speaks to the non-confronting um, the non-confrontational communication that is very common in 3HO. Mm. That one can be in a state of disapproval and you wouldn't know it, you would only know it because everybody's ignoring you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sad but true. There's no direct, honest communication. It's just like the subtle art of picking up on other people's judgment and shame. And mm. that internalized becomes very confusing because it's essentially like, mutating ourselves to get a level of approval and i think we see that a yeah, lot yeah. like you what you're saying and, yeah you adapt yeah. if, if yeah, you, you adapt. if you're not centered in yourself you adapt because you want to belong to the group you want to be part of it for sure that's the reason why mm. you came there there's something longing in yourself that you want to be part of it but it's a high price you pay in the end you know mm. Mm. take us back to um yeah. having first <clears throat> met uh say nonic dev and um you know, for those that don't know, Nanak Dev has a long history of, of of abuse to many people in our community, especially some of the young people in India. Mm -hmm. um, I personally remember him very well from my community when I was young. He was in the Phoenix Ashram. I remember his kids as well and his wife at the mm -hmm. time. And then years later, he got sent to India. Um, but you had a unique level of connection and relationship with him uh, at the time. You got referred to his gong trainings, right? And he yes. was living in Berlin. He had reestablished his life in Germany. Is there yeah. anything you want to share from that time? Well, yeah, I can share a lot. It would take 25 hours. Probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I try to keep, keep it short. Like <laughs> Highlight it for us. Yes. So I, uh, my, my first gong meditation experience was at the German Kundalini Yoga Festival in Oberlete. It was 2011. And from that point, when I wake up after this meditation, I was so overblissed and overblessed, like 
can find words. Incredible. And the first impulse I got after this gong meditation was, it just came like downloaded into my system. I have no idea who I am, where I am, but I want to figure out how, how I can do the same thing. How does that work? Where do I have to go to learn how to play an instrument that way that I can make these experiences and share the experiences for other people? That's it was just like in, into my system. Mm. Yeah, and then I went back to Hanover, asked my teacher if he knew someone who was teaching the gong like this. And he said, yeah, not many people out there, especially not in Germany, but um, have a look at Berlin. There is none active and look for him and maybe make contact and ask if he's going to teach or having a training there. And that's what I did. Switch on my computer. Nanak Dave, Gong Training Berlin. And I saw like a website from an ashram, like with people with long beards and white turbans. And I was like, oh no, please not. <laughs> please not. That's not for me. You know, I was like, so is that really necessary to learn how to play the gong? Hmm. Okay, let's give it a try. So I made contact and I wrote about my situation that I'm very interested in learning how to play the gong, but at the same time, I never wanted to, to do Kundalini yoga teacher training. And in the description of the teacher, uh, of the gong meditation training, it was a whole year training with like five or six whole weekend um, sessions. It was like mentioned, you, ha you have to have level one Kundalini yoga teacher training. And I said, okay, then it's not for me. So be it. But I uh, wrote an email to her, to his wife, to Nanak Dev Kaur, and it was really nice contact. We had a really warm conversation and I explained, you, you know, I had this gong meditation experience and I want to learn, but I'm not willing to take, take a Kundalini yoga teacher training. That's not for me. I knew that from the yeah. very first time because I saw, saw so many things that didn't fit to me, that didn't feel right. And that was always a, most of the time a clear decision that I didn't want to take a Kundalini yoga teacher training. And so many people tried to convince me. Mm. You have to, you should, it's going to improve your life. Look how nice we are doing our things here. If you just try it and blah, blah, blah. So, And then I explained, I don't want to do the teacher training, Kundalini yoga teacher training. And then they changed like the... Uh, the requirements and they said oh no we just changed it um or maybe it was like okay because we had this conversation that she she did okay you can attend the training anyways so yeah and so um before just right before the training should start i think it was in march um i was writing and was what it was about the training can i come and it was like oh no it's full it's complete we have all the attendance and i was like oh no and then was another another time where I said, okay, maybe it's not for me. Maybe I should not do this. But then she kind of managed that I could join this training. And so I did my gong meditation training in 2012 in Berlin. Traveled the first time to Berlin. Met Nanak Dev first time at the first day of the first training weekend. Never seen before. Never took a training. Never took a class. Never took a workshop. Nothing at all. Because, you know... That was not important for me at that time. I felt this, this has touched my heart so deeply to have this gong meditation experience. I just go there. I go with my inner guidance or whatever that was at the time. And when I saw him the first time, maybe this is very confusing right now or contrary, or I don't know how to describe. But when I saw him the first time when I entered the room, I really felt a kind of a warm and loving situation and environment. I could not find words for it. I, I, f I felt there was more warmth and more love in that room than I felt with my own dad, you know? Mm. Yeah. And that was confusing to me, like having this perception or feeling of being okay how I am and feeling this level of love and also the way how he was talking to the group and to me, it's 
it's for me very confusing to hear about all the things that happened in the 70s and 80s and stuff like this because this kind of doesn't match you know f from my perspective i mean when i talk to other people like lou you or other people that experienced their experience that also doesn't doesn't match i see that it's it's difficult to 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 bring that together and i think it's so, a part of the complexity of our community is that somebody's somebody's abuser is somebody else's mentor mm. or somebody else's helper at the worst time and then somebody else you know it's it's a very convoluted thing yeah. to it's like incest in a family <clears throat> yeah. you know one child got one treatment and another child got another treatment and it's mm. a very hard thing for us to unwind because not all abusers abuse all people yeah and i never experienced any abuse or power issues or something like this i mean he was a kind of a challenging teacher in fact mm -hmm. but when I, when I think about what, what I was figuring out the last years, like digging into to all the history and the story of 3HO and all these allegations like Miri Piri and power issues and beating up little children, it's, it's so confusing to me because I didn't see any of this. And what, what I can say about the way Nanak Dev was teaching, I always found it very grounded and very balanced in these days like we're talking about 2012 to 2015 which is just two and a half years i spent from the end of 2013 till the point he was passing away in the beginning of 2015 we were i was living in his ashram in the tribuna ashram which was not a really 3ho ashram he did his own thing there and he was teaching yoga, which was not basically Kundalini yoga. He called it Maha yoga, which included more like the Hatha yoga path, like the Gatka, really drumming, grounding, all this work, mm -hmm. which we talked about earlier in our conversation, which is not just meditating, meditating and up in the sky, but also doing the groundwork. And that, that's what I experienced, how he, he was teaching there. And I always found it very contrary to the normal Kundalini yoga way of um, yeah, of teaching which which most people did and yeah it's it really caught my attention that there's a way to work with the kundalini energy yeah just keep it in that let's keep it in that term kundalini energy instead of kundalini yoga because i think kundalini yoga what most people think what kundalini yoga is is a different thing than talking about the kundalini energy and there I realized, okay, he's put something together like these, all these elements, maybe over the last 30, 40 years, he was studying under Yogi Bhajan and with Yogi Bhajan and maybe against Yogi Bhajan, I don't know, um, which really kind of worked, especially when I thought about the gong, which has also the capacity to bring people very fast in very deep meditation and transformation transformation states what is needed to make that a good grounded profound experience and that's mm. what i really could figure out in in the gong meditation training when i was studying with him and also in the one and a half years when i lived with him yeah mm. but i also when i moved into the ashram there were things that were really confusing me i never thought that i would move into ashram in ashram so <laughs> it's like for what do i know that need that now mm. okay but it was the point when I split up with my ex-partner because there was too much things going on. She was getting deeper in the, you know, like the Kundalini yoga teacher training path and stuff like this. And yeah, too much, too much stuff going on. And I made the decision. I can't stay in this relationship any longer. I begin to relapse and consume more substances to balance what is unbalanced in our relationship. Not that I want to blame that relationship. I take care about my part, which I have to take care of, of course, but there was a point, okay, I, I need to change in my life. That's it's, I cannot live with a person that um, sinks deeper, deeper, deeper into a stru structure, which I realize already at that point, end of 2013, 
unhealthy, unbalanced and like grabby and taking people's money, saying them you have to take level two now and seeing her with their piles of printed leaves from the 70s and 80s and 90s and all these paperwork and what a training is that, you know? Like this paper piles piled up in our living room and she was just like <laughs> all over the place and I was like, wow, no, not, not, not possible. So, yeah. What were some of the things you noticed in the ashram that just felt off for you when you lived there? First thing that happened right before I wanted to go there, um, I had two phone calls with Nanak Dev then and um, we figured some things out if there was a room free in the ashram and something to work for me in Berlin because I had to give up my job in Hanover where I was, I was living to that point. Um, and then it was clear that I wanted to move there and then um, he called me and he said something really bad happened to the ashram and I was like, oh, maybe it's not for me again. <laughs> maybe I should not go. And he said someone um, committed suicide. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Whoa. And yeah, it was shocking to me. And I didn't know about much about what was going on in the ashram, but at the time I moved in, there were already really liked, um, uh, like, um, yeah, what's the word? I mean, it was Nanak Dev who was running the ashram, like from the spiritual and from the yoga part, and there were the landlords, like they owned the property and the building and stuff. And they created the project um, together um, back in 2000, whatever that was then. And at the point when I moved in, more or less everything was yeah, in trouble, in serious trouble. Like no con communication. Um, everybody had his own ideas how to run the ashram. People were just sitting in their rooms and flats and not talking to each other, but sending emails like over mail system and insane 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 and they when i moved in they mentioned to me yeah you have to be on the house mailing list that we can inform you about everything what is going on here and i read about some of these emails and was like no not really i'm not interested in that stuff and he said yeah but you have to i it was it was the landlord you have to that we can inform you if something's happening maybe the heating is uh, is uh, not working and i say I will figure out if the heating is not working. I don't need to be on your mailing list for this. You know? Yeah, and this, this were, were the things that were, yeah, I mean, I came there, I didn't come for the ashram aspect. I didn't want to live in the community. I went there because after I finished my gong meditation training at the end of 2012, I wanted to learn more about the gong and I wanted to learn from Nanak Dev because I had this profound, teaching experiences from him. And so my main purpose was to move into the ashram to go away from Hanover, but also live close to him. So and that's what I did for one and a half years. All what happened like the ashram structure and community, I realized it was really difficult. People were fighting against each other and everything was falling apart. And I mean, I, I could feel that he also was very tired of um, being kind of the leader of the ashram and, and stuff like this. And he just yeah, tried to figure out. He was at that time working on a to to setting up a study um, to prove that the gong could help with PTSD disorders. You know, he was very into this together with his wife. Also, they were already doing one study before, um, and he was on his path to bringing his. I would say his essence of his work he did in his life, maybe also this experience he made in the 70s and 80s. So to to turn that to something which really supports and helps people. That's what I saw most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> you stayed at the ashram, started noticing the sideways communications, the non communications, just kind of like the inner ethos that didn't didn't stimulate you at all, but you were able to learn from him and um, get some gong yeah. training and then and then then how did how did it carry on where do you want to go from here yeah to to 
cut it short a little bit. I mean, I could really talk for hours about um, all this experience, but I think it doesn't doesn't bring that much that much value to the conversation. I don't know. Um, so I lived quite close to him and with him, and we were talking daily about things. And uh, maybe that's interesting to to add that here that he was what I saw very critical about the whole 3HO thing. He was, when we talked together, very critical about Yogi Bhajan and the things that I heard from him. He was saying a lot that he was a sucker and he was really yeah, mocking up people. And he, one time I, re I, I remember he mentioned that it's to him very sad to see that so many people in the Kundalini Yoga community, community especially in America, put so much energy, their lifetime, their their money, their work value, everything into that system. And he was in contact with many people from the from, from the US that now are in their 60s or 70s or 80s, you know, like getting retired. And they have nothing, like no money, no health insurance, nothing of that. And I experienced that he, Nanak Dev, was very disappointed and also sad about this a lot, like realizing that the guy he was following for so many years and holding Yogi Bhajat in that position, in the end created a system which, which was not working. No? Sometimes also like the, 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 what he said, like he, he didn't manage, manage to manage the whole community and he didn't manage to create really well-balanced and um, yeah, nourishing leaders. So that's, wow. that's really what he realized. So, I wow. like just can imagine the the pain. Maybe he also was in realizing this and trying to figure out to create something other to this. And he he had terms like Kundalini Yoga Mafia, and he said this in his classes, in his courses. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and it's. Yeah. It's, and that, that was the first time when I heard something different, where I experienced there is someone and he had like, you know, you know how he looked. He was like this heavy, heavy guy, you know, former Hells Angels um, attendee, like warrior aspect and long mm -hmm. beard and sword fights and stuff like this. But and a hung turban, the whole the thing. hung turban, yeah. this, this whole thing. But what I saw there and he, he heard there was like he tried to yeah, to talk about things. Also at the yoga festivals in France when he was in st on stage. I mean, in the years when I saw it, he, he was sitting there and he named things. He said, this is fucked up. What's going on here? Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to pause here and just say, like, somebody like him who had been around since the 70s, 80s, kind of like his whole personal story, then having a family born in, and then you know, yeah. ending up like there's so many personal experiences I'm sure he had then being in the position he was in to overlook the first group of kids that went to school in India. Mm. And he was that main caretaker, which is where he had a ton of stories of him being a predator and abuser of other people. Um, but then years after that, like his own reconciling, his own, you know, healing process, whatever he mm. went to figure out within his own family mm. and his own psyche. Mm. What I'm bringing up about this is the fascination around him speaking to these things at that time to you to me really represents a lot of the involvement of kind of the old historical teachers that did mm. wake up but didn't necessarily mm. renounce their whole experience didn't mm. walk away but tried to integrate their experience took the parts that worked for them yeah. you know, stopped dealing with KRI, created their own yeah. little unique training and would speak to the hypocrisy, would speak to the incongruency, would speak to what you're saying, the Kundalini Mafia or the mm. hierarchy of abuse or the yeah. lack of transparency. And I'm saying this because I feel like my father fit that category a little bit. He did mm. the best he could to remove mm. himself from the aspects that weren't working for him, the hierarchy, mm. the the... Mm corporate type uh, model where mm. things were run from the top down, you know, there were essence, there was a part mm. of his essence that mm. wasn't fitting in as things got more and more established, right? Mm. And 
I think Nani Dev, what you're saying he spoke to is similar, that he didn't lose his life because he had found who he was the best he could along his way, but he was able to speak to this and that and being mm. a seeker of truth, that must have felt really good that somebody is finally speaking to what's in plain sight kind of incongruencies or top-down learning or mm. secrecy or whatever mm. the things are mm. that you meet somebody it's like it's like water in a desert oasis yeah 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 like that and and i i think this is really important because as much as nanak dev might have a long history of hurting and abusing plenty of people he also had his own journey in his own experience of with his own teacher and then whatever happened within his own coming home back to himself and whatever that way meant. And so for him to have these types of conversations with you while he was running his own system in Germany, again, speaks to how he, he could, he knew something was off, but it wasn't his place to try to dismantle that. Instead, the people who came to him, he would speak to it and he would speak to the way that he was here to teach. And mm -hmm. I know there are other people that have carried on teaching, whether it's Kundalini energy or other types mm -hmm. of practices mm -hmm. that originally came from YB and the KRI system and eventually just kind of migrated out to do their own form of teaching because mm -hmm. of that spiritual mafia, Kundalini mafia energy. Mm -hmm. They And back in like the 80s and 90s, a lot of teachers defected and just said, you know what, I'm not going to be a part of KRI. I don't like where that's mm -hmm. going. But they yeah. didn't disidentify with their experience or with with their own spiritual path they just carried on teaching the way they chose to and not being affiliated with the systems of 3HO yeah, and yeah. I, I mean in a, in a way he was the black sheep all the time and because he, he he took the position to go on stage in France he, he he tried to to make things differently he tried to address issues but he also realized it's almost impossible to the to the let, let's say them like the German leading Kundalini Yoga people that are the lead trainers and, and organizers and stuff like this. I mean, he knew them from the beginning or from the early years, but I mean, maybe it's the same thing. They, they went on different paths and he realized, okay, there's something out of balance with all in white and just meditating all the day. Let's try to figure out to bring something in which could help to balance or to slowly change the system from underneath instead of mm -hmm. going there. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's a difficult position. I mean, he, he went there in black clothes on the stage. He brought uh, four or five women with a taiko drumming group completely clothed in black. <laughs> you know, it's, he was pro provoking this to, to say, hey, look, something is missing. There is one part missing. I mean, everything was a big show, of course. He's an American dude. He was an American dude. But when you <laughs> see like, OK, everything is white, and they walk in for four or five black clothed women. What's the message? You are you are overseeing an important part, which is part mm -hmm. of the human existence. Mm -hmm. Where is the darkness? Where is the where is the dark stuff? Where where is the hidden stuff? He wants mm -hmm. you, you don't want to see that. And he tried to, yeah, to to put it into this straight stage stage thing, you know, to mm -hmm. to show yeah, things. That, yeah. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I also just want to speak to so that listeners understand one of the things that's very complex complicated about how the training system has evolved is that like in my dad's generation, you know, in the early years, Yogi Bhajan just taught people and sent them out to teach. And the mm -hmm. trainings kind of came from the local areas. And then as things started to centralize, yeah. you know, they started to try to get those early teachers, you know, those first yeah. generation teachers to come and take teacher training. And a lot of them were like, screw you. We've been teaching teachers for years now. Why would we go pay for you to, to take a train? You know, so then there was this like grandfather clause where a lot of those teachers got to, got to get grandfathered mm. in and I remember that was like around 92 because my dad was uh, mm -hmm. looking into doing that. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because 
the way that the training system has evolved, which again, I'm not too familiar with, you know, there's the level one and then level two turned into five different trainings paid for at, at different yeah. times. Yeah. Usually it takes about another two years to get through all five. And then after that, there's another three years, of what's called the Aquarian Academy, which is basically like um, volunteer teaching. You're there for, mm -hmm. for the senior mm -hmm. teachers, you're shadowing them. Mm -hmm. So basically you're volunteer, you're paying to volunteer for three years. And, and what I think they're, they're attempting to do is kind of create this atmosphere similar to how all the first gen were volunteering and saving their whole life for YB and, and this kind of idea of living in living the teachings through the seva and all the other mm -hmm. reasons. But the reason I'm bringing, again, the reason I'm explaining this is because at any time, if a teacher, you know, has taken all this, like has 20, 40 years of historical experience in the Kundalini community, mm. you know, they can carry on and create their own training program. They don't have to follow the KRI system. Um, so if they get kicked out, let's say they're an, an ethical teacher and they yeah, get kicked yeah. out, they can yeah. carry on and keep teaching whatever they want. And they just not affiliate themselves with 3HO or Kundalini. They can yeah. still keep wearing a turban, create their own ethos. They can do whatever, right? Mm. And and so as people, quote, defected, it didn't mean that they didn't stop being an influencer or a teacher. They just taught through their unique lens and the things mm. they felt maybe didn't complete the full story. Yeah. And I appreciate what you're saying that, like, he was bringing his people in. They were wearing black. It was like he was exploring a different realm that obviously wasn't getting touched on in all the years mm. he was in Kundalini and 3HO. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and this is just yep. an important aspect to remember when it comes to like how we find teachers and the kind of like the holy, the holy ethos of like, oh, there this person is all fancy in a turban and they look so holy and they must have so much mm. wisdom. And we mm. don't know the long story of where they came from. Right. It's kind of like. Yeah. And especially like the name changing people come come in. And then uh, they just take a new name. You, you even can't research them, who they are and where they came from. It's just like a, some, some agents, <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. so some secret agents. Who are these people? Yeah, all of a sudden there are Satari from one day to the other. And there are many yeah. Sataris in Germany. So if mm -hmm. you talk one about, about one Satari and one other person thinks it's that one, but it's a different one. It's, it's, extra confusing it is it extra right. confusing and it's a, i think it's a part of what it means to create a good cult is you're 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 scraping people from identity and then you're creating extra levels of confusion yeah yeah around non-identity so, so much stuff to and not hold the time you know now that they've had this uh, saying like a good teacher is giving you another knot time after time if you have solved one knot and not one knot you get another one a bigger one and it's somehow like what i experienced yeah a lot like there's so much stuff going on and this going on that going on and the whole the teaching structure all the manuals and books and i was always wondering why are there 500,000 kriyas if the system is working that good why are there 500,000 kriyas or more for what are they needed maybe the system isn't that good mm. <laughs> maybe mm. maybe it's not a it's not a complete system and it's an interesting aspect that you bring up here with like this um structures of the training and i can tell about this a little bit more because a little bit later in 2017 when my current partner and i opened the yoga studio in berlin we also were hosting kundalini yoga teacher trainings we, we weren't giving them we just hosted the space and um, supported the, the trainer in, in giving the training there but so i have some insights i had them before already of course but so i, I know a little bit how that's set up and it's a lot about pushing people there, making the money. Okay, 20 people join more, more for the training. Then we rent a bigger room. It doesn't matter. Just in, everybody in, everybody in. So, yeah, just all about the money. And where I was coming from, like, I decided I don't want to take, to take a teacher training. And a lot of people tried to convince me. Also, when I tried to, started um, to teach, um, I, to go out with my gong and give sessions with gong and... Of course, I took some of the teachings I got from Nanak Dev, which he embedded in the Gong teaching. So it's it's helpful to have a good working, good balanced Kundalini Yoga Kriya to bring the energy into motion, to prepare and open the people up for the Gong experience. Yes, um, but even at that point, I said, okay, I I I understand how that works, and for me, it was 
more important to choose one, two, three Kriyas. I really know from the bottom of my heart and I can teach them in whatever situation and not being in the situation to choose a new Kriya each time I teach. It's just insane to me. For me, it was pretty helpful and important to take few Kriyas and go deep with them, study them, study all of the aspects, teach them slowly, teach them a little bit faster, teach them like this, like that, vary with the different needs of the situation and not just like, this is the Kriya, it was written down at 7th August of 1948 by someone who was sitting next to Yogi Bhajan and that's it, we have to take that into 2018 and teach it there like this. Why? Mm. Why? This mm. was always the question to me, why? And it's difficult when you try to do your thing in a community that is so keen on this idea of you have to be a trainer, you have to be a trainer, you have to be a certified trainer. They are addicted to certificates. Like somebody, people are addicted to Kundalini, some to cocaine, some to certificates. Like it's just like the next no level. And yeah, it's hard to to maintain, maintain something inside this community when people are asking you, and where did you do your teacher training? And I say, I didn't do any. And they were like, what? How dare you to teach Gong? You are not allowed. Says who? You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good points. Um, I think an added element of, of abusive processes within our training system, the KRI training system, is that KRI, you know, gets paid a large sum to use this body of work but then the senior teacher like the people hosting mm. the training mm. all they have to do they have to bring in a senior teacher there's just yeah. all these amounts yeah, they have to be paid to the to the next level and, and what's important here is that the trainings can differentiate so much depending on who's leading the teaching Right? Like the so, content and the way they, it's it's going. that's exactly right. So even though there's this body of work, yeah. the way yeah. that information is delivered, it's very much up to that lead teacher. And so regionally, your level ones and your level twos can be vastly different based mm -hmm. on how that person is delivering. Now we think that's normal in anywhere, but in, <laughs> in Kundalini Yoga, it's very very much more of an issue, I think, because one can have a very abusive training based on their senior teacher kind of creating a, a parameter of of restrictions and things you have to do, not have to do. And then mm -hmm. like another teacher training, that same level one training can be way more wide open and exploratory if that senior teacher has had an experience mm -hmm. where they are teaching Kundalini Yoga from from that lens. So there's not a lot of oversight. KRI mm -hmm. just wants to get their money, but they yeah. don't necessarily stay involved or make sure that certain things are- it's just um, too much effort, how, how to handle that. I, I think so, I think yeah. so. And, um, but it adds the added element of, of abusive predatory patterns being able mm. to replicate because there's, there's no real oversight um, or systems that really support students to get mm. an essence of what needs to be taught as opposed to um, just up to the discretion of quote a senior teacher and as we know the the teachers are so vastly different everybody's experience how Nanak Dev is going to teach a teacher training is going to be very different than say how someone else teaches a teacher training because their experiences in becoming students were so vastly yeah, different. and it's tricky because when they're in the posi position of a teacher a teacher trainer or a lead trainer then they are already uh, climbed up the hierarchy so it's just like they are dependent what you described earlier that they bring new people it's like the whole mar marketing thing again yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, and then you get attached to the money, and then you see, okay, thirty people times uh, three thousand euro—that's quite a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, why not try this? Yeah, it's 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 a tricky point. So. Mhm. Mm mhm. And even when you try, I mean, we we were in the position when Nanak Dev passed away in two thousand fifteen. There was the question: Okay, who's giving this Gong meditation trainings right now after him after he passed away? 
It's kind of funny because when I was writing my uh, information for this conversation, I realized, okay, we also named it a gong meditation training after Nanak Dev. And then it's, it's the same thing, like <laughs> it's like as taught by Nanak Dev, which <laughs> in the end doesn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense in 2015 or 2016 because, I mean, it's teaching the gong how we teach it and not falling into the same trap again. But I mean, there were three people who, who came, who, who were in the position to, to give these trainings, but uh, after he passed away, because it wasn't really clearly set up who was in the position, there was kind of a fight about these three persons. One was me, one was my co colleague in Hamburg and another guy from Southern Germany. And uh, everybody, of course, wanted to give these gong meditation trainings. Um, me not really because i had that feeling okay i just did my gong meditation training in 2012 maybe it would be a really good idea to play gong for 10 years and then see how i am there in 10 years maybe that was my feeling but also the conversations i had with nanak Dev, sorry um they there was an information that he trusted me in some way he didn't trust many people that's what I heard a lot, also from his wife, that uh, it was for him, for Nanak Dev, quite surprising that he would open to somewhat, someone like me that on, on, on a deeply level, like we had this connection. And mm -hmm. so we talked also about the gong things and he gave me instructions how to teach gong. And there was this fight, like everybody had this idea, no, I'm the one, I'm the one, I am the one, no, I'm the one and I have to do. And I was like, oh man, that's that's really not the point where I want to be. So, but there was also like kind of a pressure because there were already trainings he prearranged and they had to be taken over. So, we figured out a way. Also, um, talked to Nanak Dev Kaur how she thought about this and were in, we are really into hearing her how 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 she would feel good with this. Like not saying okay we are doing it right now we have to do but figuring out how she would feel comfortable in taking these teachings from him and then figuring out a way. But the point I want to come to is like what I experienced then. I mean, Nanak Dev was bringing everything out of KRI and 3HO and figuring out his own way some, in some way. And then was like, okay, I feel because my Gong colleague from Hamburg, she was more into the structure like the Hamburg crew and stuff and i realized okay this is going to be pulled in the other direction again you know nanak <laughs> made to move it out and then it just like was like a magnetic pull into that system again because they were less like how to set up the training how the cost should be and i had a totally different idea how how we could set up this but there was a really strong pull no it has to be somehow confirmed to the yeah, to the 3HO KRI structure. And that's what I where are already felt in 2015 when we when we hosted the first thing. Okay, I, I do it like this. And it, there were parts that were really interesting and I really liked about giving these trainings, but I already had this this feeling it's it's going into a for me not good working direction. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you saw that transition happening and then obviously you started hearing, you knowing that the Carta thing was thing was happening in 2015. That's all around that same time. So you're starting to just notice there's it's no the honest, time. authentic discussion around yeah. what's actually happening. Yeah. And for me, it feels also wrong, like questioning Satnam and the culture of Satnam and then having this technology like this this technology, Kundalini Yoga, and having this, this knowledge and this experience and the teaching with the gong and then going somewhere where I see, okay, lots of things are not working here, how, how to handle that. And then also on top, being me in the position, having no Kundalini Yoga level one <laughs> training, not wanting to do some, it's, you can't go there. It's just, I, I would have found myself in the same place as Nanak Dev. 10 or 20 years ahead. And I decided not my path. 
It's mm. not. I'm not interested. I'm really not interested. It figured out it was, yeah, ruining my ru ruining my my health in some way. Also. And this was around 2017 that you're that you're recognizing this. I began to recognize in 2015 already with the Gong first Gong meditation training we were teaching. Yeah. So, okay. And then we did one in in Frankfurt. We did one in Hanover, where uh, Hanover Hamburg. It was combined, and one in S northern Sweden, like with um, students who were taking the training with me and other people from from my Gong colleague in Hamburg. Um, yeah, but also it was so much work. It was so much to do, as you mentioned before. There's so much going on. It's so confusing. You have to set up these trainings, and we we set them up in a really really short period of time, like within few weeks. So and not like okay, we. I mean, it was good prepared. I would say well prepared. Um, but for me, it was like. I didn't didn't feel really ready, you know. I would have would have loved to have more time to prepare for this, but the pressure mm. was there. People were wanting to learn gong meditation. People were already booked in in, in the training in Frankfurt, and was like <laughs> just doo -doo 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 -doo. and four trainings within two years is a lot of stuff. Have you never done that, done that before? And I didn't. My colleague was into um, like elderly people Kundalini yoga training she had some experience how to set up and i think a lot of the structure came from there but mm -hmm. yeah it was it was, was a lot of stuff it was a lot of traveling preparation communication mm -hmm. it's i mean to to host the training is a lot of stuff you so you take... just decided to kind of like move your way out of doing those trainings and just started doing your own gong work or what what happened yeah we did the last uh, gong meditation training in berlin also in the yoga studio me and also my my current partner and me ran there for two years and that was the last training i was giving there and i for me it was clear i i don't want to i don't if it's like this and if it's not able to talk about certain things if i don't um have the feeling that there's the culture to to point to some important issues we have since latest 2015 <laughs> which yeah. we now know long before um pfft, no i was frustrated frustrated confused um or also feeling addiction issues coming back you know so went the so whole i want to pause here and just say i was at the yoga festival in 2017 so 2016 mm -hmm. was my first year and then 17 and then 18 mm -hmm. and i want to say it was in 2017 that um the buzz about carticing was going around or uh carticing in france um and yeah. You know, hearing you say that it actually had come out in 2015, the culmination of it was in 2017 because, quote, KRI kicked him out and mm. he did his own YouTube video to communicate to his following what really went down from his lens. I didn't mm. get into it, but what I remember about that was, A, how many people were so... Um, double binded internally. A lot of yoga students were really up in arms and uncertain and kind of distraught. Mm. And as mm. you're saying, nobody was addressing it. You know, there were major classes and no scene. Mm. Nobody was like addressing the issue. And yeah. hearing that it was taking place for two years and nobody talking about it. I think it was two years. It. Yeah, I, I remember that, I mean, it was 2015. Yeah. That's what you said. And this is so common. Like, and this is what's coming out of my body memory more than ever is mm. how many things were happening in plain sight that were incongruent and yet mm. nobody was talking about it. Mm. And to grow up in an environment like yeah. that and even to put yourself in an environment like that for over 10, mm. 20 years, mm. unconsciously oh, what's happening in our own bodies mm. is we're denying our reality. It's a form of gaslighting ourselves. Yeah. If we're constantly gaslit and we're denying what's in plain sight, we actually are creating a slow disconnect from our own inner guidance system. Mm. And it's more normal than we want to believe. We just end up not talking about uncomfortable things. Yeah. But that stuff is still permeating. 
And I yeah, remember because you're always you're always named and the, the guy who's spreading bad news or like uh, you know, oh stop just, being negative G hey yeah, it's not yeah. negative it's happening yeah. it's not negative you know so yeah, yeah. it's almost as if the word neutrality and negativity mm. has gotten synonymous within the 3HO mm. culture with addressing real hard truth mm. Mm. and yeah. that you know it's not neutral or negative to address mm. what's abusive and in plain sight, you know? Yeah, and, and there was a point, I, I think it was in 2015 when when I got to know about this uh, Carter Singh things, and I really felt strange to go to France and act as everything is normal and put the gongs on stage. And I was like to my colleague, why don't we go on that stage and sit on the edge of that stage with the feet and legs there, there and just say the gongs stay silent. We have to talk about something. Yeah, let's address this. Let's let's help heal. Let's speak because it out. Because we have a spot. We have three spots on the yoga festival before the white tantric. It's one and a half hour each approximately. Yes. There's a lot of time to speak to a lot of people. A lot people, of healing to a can lot happen. Of people. Amplified. Every lot of people can hear that. No, we can't do that. That's no, no, no. We have to keep the, the show running. Was the message, was not the, the definite word, but that's what I felt. Okay, we the show must go on. Yeah. So, sad but true, but it, that's yeah, that's very sad happening. but true. And yeah. I want to I want to say this because my approach to that, I, I taught four workshops. Um, mm. You know, it's three before the tantric, and then one right afterward. And I just I heard people talking about it and. I brought it right into my workshop. I remember saying, listen, you know, yeah. what's happening with Carta Singh, you know, sleeping with his students. This is not new. It's not unique to him. It's not unique to Europe. Mm. You know, it started with YB. It passed on to all of his male teachers for sure. My mm. dad being one of them. This is a long history of secret cover-ups of sleeping mm. with many, many students Mm. married people getting married off i mean the history and the sinister historical nature of of um sexual infidelity being at the basis of the kundalini teacher student relationship it's so normalized and yet not discussed and so i would mm. say that i would be like if you think there's anything other than that happening in kundalini yoga you have rose colored glasses on you're not seen <laughs> clearly you're yeah. wanting to find some place of purity and you're taking your childhood trauma and you're trying to juxtapose it into this place and make this practice your savior and that's your problem because this practice yeah, isn't a savior like the, like the big spider is spinning the net you know <laughs> yeah and and this you know, students appreciated that honesty. And this is what I'm hearing you're saying. I mm. spoke like that as a teacher because I was trying to reconcile my love for my life upbringing with the hypocrisy I knew existed. Yeah. And yeah. I was trying to speak to it as a way to heal it in me. And yeah. this I is... I did that too, yeah. Yes. I, and and yeah, yeah, what I, I hear you saying is you couldn't... When you can't do that, as a teacher or an influencer, if you're on this mass stage and you can't it's speak, harming yourself, yeah. It's heck harming. yeah, it's harming yeah. you yeah. and you're robbing your students yeah. of a chance to I, heal. I, I mean, I didn't, I, I could not manage or maybe I, I didn't have the <laughs> the balls to do it on that moment, on, on that stage in, in, in the yoga festival friends. But when I was teaching like in smaller groups or I, I was yeah. traveling around with my workshops or also in our gong meditation trainings, I did talk about this things because there I saw, okay, I'm the one who is sitting here. I'm the one who is experiencing these things. Maybe there are people who are not seeing this or maybe hadn't any contact with this, but it's my responsibility to at least uh, inform them that it might be that they are going to confront things in the future that are part of this community and the system. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I always try to, to embed in my teachings when I was teaching. So, and I remember one situation that was the, that was the gong meditation training in Hanover. I was teaching one weekend on my own and I was bringing in that topic. Um, and I think it was in 2015 or 16, I don't remember exactly. But um, at this time, I 
that, that, that was my working title when I thought about things like this. It's like the guru business. It's a guru business. They are selling like the, the idea of the guru and everybody is the guru. And to the current day, people, people are copying this Yogi Bhajan costume version of themselves with their beard and turban and who is the whitest vest and blah, 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 blah. And I said like, hey, look, we are or I am teaching you things about the gong. I have this and that history here. I see these things and because I see them, I take them in. If I don't take them in, I am kind of compliant to that system. You know, I don't address the things and I give them, but I, I see it like if I don't talk about them, I give them on silently. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a saying like, No, I, I don't know the English word. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> say it in German. It's like. Lügen ist wie flüstern, nur leiser. Nee, I, I don't get it. I, I don't bring it together. But okay, uh, anyone listening, you can go ahead and go translate that. Yeah. And then you get the saying. But just again, I just want to point out to you that what you're speaking yeah, to is just it's really important. Like, you know, you didn't have the ability to speak to what you knew needed to be spoken to, even though you have that command of the big tent stage. I was yeah, only but... sharing in my little small group, I could do that. But yeah, that the, that the ethos, the culture, the larger experience was saying, no, we don't talk about those things. Yeah, even though when it's in I the did, hearts and yeah, minds yeah, of everybody. But, but when I did this, like in this gong meditation training, I took one hour and talk about the thing, like the guru business, like the allegations, like the sexual abuse issues, also the things that I researched at that point, uh, like the forum in, in, in the US, Wacky World of Yogi Bhajan. I talked about these things because I found it important to know when people want to go in. And there are sometimes people there also go to one gong meditation and say, wow, this is cool. Like me in my history, I want to learn about this. Okay, I give it to you, but I also bring in the dark stuff because I think yeah. it's important to bring that in. And what happened then, my gong colleague, which I was giving a training with from Hamburg, she said, how dare you to talk about the guru business in our gong meditation training? That's not the place to talk about this there. And I was like, really not? I think so. Wow. Yep, I think and so too. I think it's so important because people get to choose and create consent. They get to make their own choices when they have the full lens of, of experience. You mind, and if I don't do it, people do their research. They research more than ever and it won't take long until they figure out. Some yeah. people maybe not, but if it's about transformational work, like figuring out how to heal yourself, how to find a new way of getting along with issues in your life, it has to be part of this, I would mm -hmm. say. Maybe some other people see that differently, but for me, it's like working with the gong is it's, almost, it's not possible to, to keep that out. Yeah. So you started separating yourself from that. And um, over the last number of years, mm. you've just kind of been doing your own thing. 2017 to 2019, in the end, I was more silent. I, I really have had the feeling that I lost my voice, that I didn't have any chance to talk and speak about these things and have a feeling that it's a safe place to talk about these things. So it was yeah, maybe what you mentioned before, that it's harming yourself over time and time and time. And I was like, who should I talk to about this? And that, I mean, in 2016, 2017, there was not much going on about these. Um, when the book came out, like from Premka, it was 2000, what was 20? 20. 20, yeah. And Several before... I mean, you could find things, you could talk to some people, but just as you mentioned in the small context, like in a small group, when you really had the feeling it's it's safe and secure. When you try to mention something on Facebook, you were dismissed by all the guru observers and all the watchmen, like these installed people in, in several Kundalini yoga groups. They're just trying to know, no, that's not true. You can't talk about it like this. Where do you have your information from? It's just... 
And I mean, Facebook is not a real pl really helpful place to talk about these things because especially in Facebook, there's so much hate and violence going on on this text plane, you know, yeah, not a good place. Um, so I was really yeah, frustrated, silent and uh, realized I have to figure out a way to get myself out of this because if I get more in, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. It's just eating me up from, from the inside, you know, it's killing me. I really had the feeling that it's, it's making me crazy. Also, I mean, I was, and it was also kind of the culture of Nanak Dev being against something and criticizing and always to the point, like this is the criticized point. And now let's look and figure out a way how to turn it and transform it into th something helpful. But also this always seeing things. And that was kind of my burden that, that I always had insights maybe other people didn't have, like mm -hmm. looking behind the scenes. Also, I always said I was kind of really inside of the community, but I always had this angle in between, you know, yeah. not fitting in this structure, not having the Kundalini yoga teacher training. I would say it saved my life in some way because it yeah. helped me to, to keep these clear lenses to, to view things differently. Yeah, a and level of your own critical thinking still stayed with you. Yeah, but it's it's very exhausting, like this crit critical thinking and acting and trying to get in touch and in contact where there is no culture for it, but you see it and you see it and you see it. And you, the more you see, the more you see, the more you realize, the more you see, the more you research, the more you see. It's just also like a tra tra traumatic experience because there's so much stuff coming up like a huge wave. And then I was like, OK, I have to distance myself from that. I cannot take that anymore. When we had the yoga studio for the two years from 2017 to 2019, also very close, like realizing how the teacher training structure is set up. We had Satnam Rasain training there and you see all that things in daily practice and you see the things that are critical or to me questionable or maybe manipulative. Manipulative, 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 I can't talk anymore. <laughs> and then, but also realizing, okay, you're running a yoga studio. And you mentioned that before. You need the you money. Host the yoga teacher training. They bring a lot of money. So you're part of the system. It's so difficult we to say quiet. something. Yeah, we stay quiet. We endorse we, things that we don't necessarily believe or no, align we, with. We, in the end, we closed the studio because we said we don't want to support things like that. I mean, it's you said it too. It's not only Kundalini Yoga. You see it in other traditions too. And things are really wrecked up. The um, whole yoga community worldwide is just about money and teacher trainings. And I mean, how many of them want wanted to sell? That's what I saw already in 2015-16. Teacher training here, teacher training there, teacher training there. 20, 30, 50 people. Who do they want to teach in the end? And I also want to add the added element. Like it just creates this energy of like, I see it throughout the whole spiritual yoga world in general, as well as in our community, but just in every, in all spiritual realms, this workshop junkie, like nobody's integrating what they learned. They're just taking the next one and the next one and the next mm. one and the next one. It's just and consumption. It's, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's consumption and it's never letting the system actually re yeah. absorb, integrate and have it show up as a change in daily life. And and that really adds the addictive quality yeah. of yeah, totally. just totally. more, 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 which is, you know, yeah. just western busyness without yeah, the yeah. depth of like letting it fully mm. um fully integrated in into the, the body yeah, embed into the soil of our of our of our being and i yeah. think that's a part of the formula that we've seen within 3ho too is this al element of busyness like keep everybody busy mm. on a diet morning sauna like you said everything you have to do every day Everything and, is structured. And yet yes. we ultimately, it's still not enoughness. It's like no. not complete, not enoughness. And, and it's and this, this slow sucking dry. Mm. It's like this brittleness, this brittle dryness that over time. And, and I, I think it also embeds a, a, a level of 
or a plane of not being enough and then it added to this shame and guilt of not being enough and not being able to manage even and though we have this it. great working technology which is called kundalini yoga as taught by mr Bajan. <laughs> wow i know it's just like the more you see it the more you can see through it mm. but the less you see it the more you get absorbed into it um, thank yeah. you. This has been a very, very beautiful perspective in. I, I want to wrap up a little bit by you mm. sharing with us what your experience was like getting ready for this podcast, because I know you felt like you had left this a while ago. You had seen through it for so many years. You were kind of critically analyzing it, and yet you found yourself surprised at how much was coming up for you when you were getting ready to come on. Here. I was expecting that, you know, that's also, I think it has to do with working with the gong that much because you really can sharpening your senses or what's going on. And I figured out at one point that I have some kind of abilities to predict things like not to say, okay, this is, has to happen like this, but putting things together seeing how it developed from the past to that point and then making up my mind the okay maybe in two three years people will see what's going on and then maybe it's my my part to wait for a while and i was when this book came out of premka i was like oh my god finally finally someone speaking up raising up her voice and bringing all these things um yeah into the to, <laughs> into the the light in, in the breath in the presence and into the light yeah and you mind you see what happened around this like it was this whole tidal war, wave warfare <laughs> jesus christ the same thing how dare you that's not true it's the same 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 mechanics over and over again and i was mm -hmm. so thankful and when i saw your first episode from this i just opened some tabs here on my computer like I, I watched the episode with Narinjan Kaur, which I really appreciated for her music she she created for the community. I, I saw the episode with Mark Putman, which really touched me because he talked about the Kundalini Yoga energy in a way which really matches uh, with with that what I learned from Nanak Dev. Um, and there's so many episodes I already listened to or watched them, and it's just like, wow, all these puzzle pieces coming together and just the just the possibility to speak out and having somebody who is open-minded and open-eared to receive that and to say okay this is your experience i hear you and i don't judge it and i don't say it's maybe different yeah we can have different experience and different opinions of of things but i i think it needs that culture to be more open to bring things together and unify uh, and, and 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 to unite in this experience so and that's for me it was like i was really troubled i mean we, we had a date one week ago and i figured out i'm not able to process that i'm not able to prepare that the, the more i was thinking about all these years and it's just 10 years but it happened so much i mean coming from a point not wanting to be a kundalini yoga teacher and then being in the position following nanak dev in his footsteps in this short period of time overwhelming i don't know how to handle that but i will figure out and when i prepared this talk here i was like wow i have one one thought and 50 around this and then these images come and i walk about the field in France at the yoga festival site and oh and had this conversation there and I could not address what I wanted to talk and maybe I should have you know the whole dynamic of, of all these confusing things it just rises up from somewhere below here it's really embedded like in in the lower part of the body you know interesting yeah. interesting interesting and i was writing and writing and i was like oh how am i going to structure that it's so confusing and then i realized yeah it's confusing because the whole <laughs> thing is confusing what what could i expect it's confusing the whole thing is confusing and it's part of the nature that it yeah. confuses it it's, it's it's not meant to be in the old way how 
I, I see the Kundalini Yoga teacher trainings and the whole system is set up. It's not meant to guide people to their own reality. It's not meant to really get in touch with your own energy because when you reach the point and that's kind of natural for me when you working with your own life force energy and you have some realizations and you bring them into into contact and then people come and say no 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 not here not here it's weird it's so weird and yeah it's what it's, it is, it's, it's a, worse it's a than hard weird. Trip. Yeah. It's abusive. That's what it is. It's psychologically, spiritually, emotionally abusive. And it's yeah. really important that collectively that we're all listening to this really understand how the nature of memory and sensory memory really works because you're bringing up a very good point. You were noticing convoluted things all along. You're talking about a 10 year period of time. You finally left. But as you revisit this now to share on this podcast, mm. you get flooded with unprocessed memories of mm. confusion because the nature of the ethos of the community is built on keep people disconnected and confused but mm. disguised as mm. a sense of centeredness and wholeness but it's not it's fragmented shard parts that are constantly in shame and guilt um cycles mm. and the the practices although separately might actually have value when put into a formula that YB delivered, it's designed to create discombobulated states, mm. not grounded sense mm. of humanity. And this is a real psychosomatic mind fuck because we're yeah. hearing one thing, we're experiencing another. And so what we do is we gaslight ourselves. Oh, that must be my own psyche. That must and, be my subconscious. Instead of trusting the wisdom of my body. And it's slowly taking away your intuition. Absolutely. Very slowly. You don't slowly. trust your own observations. You don't trust your own feelings. And that's disconnecting no. you from everybody else. So, even so, in the community. You know, when I was standing at the yoga festival sites in France, there were thousands of people, but I was standing there and I realized I never felt that much alone in my whole life. Mm. How is that possible? Because everybody is in his own thing. You know, like, very, very sad experience, but probably not uh, necessary and um, part of the path to walk on. And I'm, I'm very happy that we can have this conversation. And uh, as I mentioned before, I, could, I had the feeling when I prepared my notes, I could write a book or two. And maybe that's, that's my part of my path one day. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff and currently going on because I started also to, to restructure and reframe my gong meditation trainings. When COVID hit, yeah. I decided to create an online gong meditation training course where I try to embed everything what I mentioned before. You know? It's really good that people have time to sink in with their teachings and their experience, not to keep it too tight, have a lot of time between the teaching you know? spaciousness. So now, mm -hmm. spaciousness. now I have now I have the the possibility to do it the way I, I want to set up it. And I hope it works and maybe there are some aspects that don't work. But I also take in these dis discussions of my experience I made in the 10 years in the Kundalini Yoga community to show them I'm not perfect, you know, I make mistakes. That's, 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 that's part of the human being. Like I'm, I'm open and I'm asking yeah. for getting accustomed to, to making failures and learn from them, them and also showing my students that practice with me. It's very little people. I always had, um, more interest in teaching one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or one-on-four. Everything about eight is way too much for me. We mm. had, yeah, and we had sometimes 20, more than 20 people in the gong meditation trainings. You cannot handle that. It's too much energy going on. Mm. And that's mm. what I try to, to do nowadays, like figuring out how can I keep that going on, teaching my way of yoga meditation sound with the gong and other instruments to yeah to pr provide a nourishing and 
hopefully helpful experience and at the same time opening up to if everything does match to you, please talk to me. If you made a difficult experience in one of my gong meditations, please let's have a conversation about this. When I gave a gong meditation session, I always told people at the end, this is a really, really deep experience you are doing. It's comparable to taking a psychedelic experience. It needs, needs weeks, maybe months, maybe years to um, embed this experience. Please be aware of that. And if anything comes up after this session, please contact me. If it's in the middle of the night, uh, just let me know. And already this telling people, hey, I'm there, even if the session is over in 10 minutes, but I'm there for you, whatever comes up and whatever, yeah, you, you, you think you have to share with me, I'm open to it. And I, I think this is part of, yeah, which I was maybe missing in the Kundalini Yoga experience I made um, and which I hope is you know, becoming more and more. For example, with um, with things like you set up in this beautiful format and bringing people together. And I mean, maybe also COVID uh, played a role in this because people connect so much more than before. Like, I mean, I'm sitting here on the countryside of Berlin. You are somewhere in America, but we are connecting because we have a conversation about things that uh, should be addressed. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Well, I want to say I, I really appreciate your honesty and your candidness um, to give us a lens into your experience with the 3HO Kundalini Yoga world, um, but also, you know, how you've carried on and how you are just bringing a level of humanity um, in, in creating a container that's safe mm. and supportive for the high level shifting that these levels of spiritual modalities can have on our bodies and our being. Mm. And I think we don't see enough of that in the spiritual world. And it really speaks to um, the importance that as teachers that we support creating safe spaces that let people bring their humanity, bring their life, not shape and form them into some special version, but rather let them be fully themselves and have voice to share their lens versus only yours as a teacher. Yeah, that's that's so important. It's it resonates totally with one sentence that is my in my head. Like I heard it from Nanak Dave too, and it was like, listen what I have to tell you, but take it and figure out if it's working for you. Yeah. Because if it doesn't out. resonate with you, your soul might want something else. And then that's yeah. okay. Like it's and, okay. Yeah, Parts of the things out, we find. Yeah. Figure you know? out the way that it's working for you. Like the perfect sadhana is the one that's working for you. And I think that's more value valuable than always keeping in this structure of, I have to go to somewhere and he knows it better than me. In the end, we know most of the stuff we need for our life. That's but right. giving all this authority and the power to some guru type of person that creates that imbalance in the first, right. first step. You know? Sure does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Um, well, mm. would you have anything last you want to share before we wrap up and get to your song? No, I'm deeply thankful and um, can, can say it again that I really appreciate that you open up your space and your YouTube channel and this conversations um, that there is a, a base for a culture of handling it differently as it happened before. Yeah, it's yes, really beautiful to see and also for me beautiful to see that people show up in your conversations where I thought for some years, oh, probably they are much more deep into it, like Niranjan Kaur. Um, and they, even they, they've cut their hair and they untie the turban and they talk about things, uh, how they experience them. And that's, this creates a totally new level of bonding. You know, even if I don't have to do anything with these people in my daily life, I know people have seen things they haven't seen before. And now they talk about them and it creates this feeling of not being alone. And uh, also this experience of reintegrating the perception of what I see, what I hear, what I feel and realizing 
in retrospective that things that I was questioning myself some years ago, they were right. But I just, you know, we talked about it. It's yeah, yeah, that you're confirming, you're confirming your own sense of self-trust by watching like the reflection. You get to see back, look back now and be like, wow, I was right. My intuition was right, but I was doubting. I was questioning because the I was in battle between what I'm seeing and what people are telling me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this is a great lesson. It's such a great lesson for all of us because we have to remember cults aren't going anywhere. Predators aren't going anywhere. These guru mm -hmm. formulas mm -hmm. aren't going anywhere, but we have to get better at better at cultivating self-authority and yeah recognizing how our historical trauma is repeating and replaying itself to draw us in. And um, yeah, great, great shares today. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I think it also is very helpful to get um, the German lens, the European lens. I, I always find that really helpful. Um, I know that, you know, Germany has been the area that's grown the fastest and most over throughout Europe and like the yoga festival really reflects that there's the most amount of Germans, mm. um, the, the ashrams, you know, there's just more historical mm. establishment, mm. um, over time. And so it's just interesting to hear a, a perspective into that. Yeah. I'm happy to do that because I, especially in the German culture, I, I didn't see that many people that were, um, open to talk about these things as I experienced it on my own and especially not when you are really part like the official part of the community I really had a different a difficult time and so it's it's yeah a lot of things that come together now and um, yeah bring mm -hmm. new light on the whole puzzle <laughs> truth right um, okay so share with us uh, why you chose this song Introduce why? us to the song too. It's Coldplay, Fix You. Why I chose the song. Yeah, this song is is in my life for a very long time. I I think, I don't know when it came up, but I mean, it's called Fix You from Coldplay. And it's already in the title says, fix you. Who can fix you is the question. And the whole lyrics, they begin like, when you try your best, but you don't succeed. And when you get what you want, but not what you need. And when you feel so tired, but you can sleep, stuck in reverse. And these five lines form its kind of the essence, what we were talking about the last, I don't know, <laughs> when it's 20 to 8, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> you never you know how, how much time passes on these You days. and your 40 minutes announcement. <laughs> it's interesting. Oh, no, what a, what a lie. Oh, my God. <laughs> People don't know about that. Keep that to yourself. Um, yeah, it's a really I'm, beautiful song. I like the energy of the song because it begins very, um, yeah, carefully and silent and with some lyrics and so on. Then it builds up and then it has like the main part where everything really explodes. And it also shows for me like there is a certain point you can keep on going on a certain level, but there will be a point when things explode, when the energy is too stuck, when there's too much compression there has to be a point of release and relief and this mm -hmm. is what is um yeah what is happening and happening in this song i Thank mean you. you could go on and do a whole <laughs> talking well, let's about listen. It, just listen um, and, and have a look and let it let it yeah let it flow. yeah and so listeners just so that you know we don't play the full um song because of copyright issues so if you want to hear the full song which i highly encourage because every song <laughs> has so much meaning and the yeah. words are usually um, very apropos for our own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you can listen to the Uncomfortable Conversations playlist on Spotify. So please go um, search for that and you can listen to the whole song. You can also um, donate and contribute to this podcast at gurunishan.com forward slash uncomfortable conversations. And let's go ahead and listen to Gerard's song here. So here we go.
Again, that is Coldplay mm. called Fix You. So be sure <laughs> to so listen to the full funny. song on the Uncomfortable Conversations playlist at on Spotify. Mm. Thank you Thank so you. much, Gerard. I appreciate your time and you You're sharing really your story. Mm. Um, this has been and this concludes another episode of the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast. The untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I sure appreciate you listening, and I ask that you share this podcast with someone that you love. It's available on all podcasting platforms, and for the visual, you can take a look at YouTube. If you'd like to contribute to this broadcast, you can make a one time or monthly donation at gurunishan.com forward slash uncomfortable conversations. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, please send me an email at guru uh, sorry at gn at gurunishan.com. You can also subscribe and follow me at my website as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks again for sharing this podcast. Thank you for sharing your stories. And most of all, thank you for taking the time to listen and allowing yourself to be arranged from the testimonies of other people within our community. Thanks so much. And we'll talk to you on the next episode. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. All right, I paused it, but we're still live on YouTube. Yeah. But this is no longer part of the recording. Just wanted mm -hmm. to say thank you, yeah. so we can say goodbye normally. <laughs> um, awesome. That was beautiful. Ton of comments on the YouTube channel, so feel free to go and, and take a look at that. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't looking, but I just noticed the stream. So oh. thank you, everyone, for tuning in on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe to my channel and be sure to share this podcast with someone else and keep spreading the word. Also review it on the podcasting platforms. It helps. Yeah, that's really, really, really appreciate this work you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm, bye. -bye. bye. <laughs>